Hey guys, in this video we're going to go through a recap of the practice that we did in the last video which was the storyboard and the map demo. So let's start off by going through the app flow of the multi-view application. It was the first multi-view app that we did. And if you can remember, in the beginning we embedded the initial view into a navigation controller object. And then from there we created a second view and attached the second view controller to manage that view. And then we were able to switch back and forth between the two views. So the app flow looks kind of like this. The entry point is still the app delegate object, but now the navigation controller is the object that manages the other two view controllers. And then correspondingly, the other two view controllers have their own views, which are described by the storyboard. And you'll notice in this diagram that I also have a location data controller object pointing to each view controller. And that's because in each view controller, we created an instance of that location data controller to get the location object from. Now in other circumstances, if we wanted the changes made to the model from one view controller to be reflected when the user moves to the second view, then we would actually share one location data controller object, one model, between the two view controllers. And that way, if the first view controller modifies some data in the model, when the user moves to the second view controller, that view controller will access the same model and it will access the data in that changed state. And so you'll have the data persisted across views. So let's talk about the navigation controller. What is the navigation controller? Well, it's a special UI view controller that manages other view controllers. And there's a link in the description below to the official Apple documentation if you want to read more about it. It's got a property called view controllers, which acts kind of like a bucket for view controllers that you can add to or remove from. And the navigation controller also provides methods to transition between any of the view controllers in the bucket. So Let's dive more into this view controller stack because in our app demo, we essentially added two view controllers to that navigation stack. Actually behaves kind of like a stack of papers. When view controllers are added to the stack, they're added to the top of the stack. The view controller at the very top of the stack is the view controller whose view is visible to the user. So what's a push transition? If you remember, when we hooked up the button from the first view to transition to the second view in the storyboard, we chose that transition as a push type of transition. And here's what's happening. In this first diagram, we have a navigation controller object that only has one view controller in its stack. And that is our initial view, the one with the coffee beans image and the address label. And then when the user clicks the button, the second view controller, the one with the map view, gets added to the top of the stack. So now the second view controller is the one that the user sees. And then when the user hits the back button, the topmost view controller gets removed, which is the map view one. And once again, the user is looking at the first view controller. So that's a push transition. We were just pushing view controllers on top of the stack. So what's a modal transition? That was another option that you were able to select from when you were creating that connection between the first view controller to the second. So that option is to present that second view controller as a modal of the first view controller. You see view controllers have an ability to present other view controllers as a modal. And it looks kind of like this in diagram form. Now in this case, the first view controller has a reference to the second view controller and it controls whether the second view controller is displayed or not. In the push case, the navigation controller has a reference to both view controllers, so it's the parent of both of them and, and it controls the transition between the two. If you want to read more about using modal view controllers and presenting view controllers from other view controllers, you can do so in a link I've provided below in the description to the Apple documentation. Another thing that we did in this last practice was to add the MapKit framework. And the reason for this, I have explained in the last video, I actually wanted to get into the, it in this one instead, but most of the time, apps don't need access to the full feature set. So by default, Xcode projects only include some basic frameworks that are common to all apps. And you'll notice that uh, the UI kit framework is one of them. You'll notice it at the top of a lot of the classes that you, uh, you use, especially like the view controller class, for example. And UIKit provides all of the elements that you've been using so far, like uh, the labels, the image views, and so on and so forth. But if you wanted to use stuff like GPS and the accelerometer and um, like map kits and other even like social networking frameworks, you have to add them into your Xcode project manually. By only including what you need, you save memory and space so that your app is lean and it's fast as possible. Okay, something else that you did in the last demo was subclassing and overriding methods. So an object-oriented program, which is the form of programming you're learning right now, there's an 
concept of class inheritance. And this means that when we create a class, we can make it a subclass of another class. And you'll notice this because when we create new classes in, in Xcode and we choose Objective C class, we are always provided with a box to put in the name of the class and another box to put in the subclass. So the best way to explain how class inheritance works is using an example. Uh, let's say we have a class called car, which contains a method called drive and a property called transmission type. All cars have a transmission type, so we're using a property to keep track of it. And furthermore, all cars should be able to be driven, so we have a drive method of our car class. Now what if we wanted to create another class called BMW car? We could create it as a standalone class and then declare a drive method inside of that class and declare a transmission property of the BMW car class as well. But instead of that, we could actually make the BMW car class as a subclass of the car class. So in this arrangement, the car class is the parent and the BMW car class is the child. And this allows the BMW car class to inherit all of the properties and methods of the parent car class. So you don't have to rewrite it. So when another object calls the drive method of a BMW car object, it'll actually be calling the drive method defined in the parent car class. And likewise, BMW car has the transmission type property simply by subclassing car. It doesn't need to redeclare it in its own class. And later on, we can actually have more subclasses of the car class, all of which inherit the properties and the methods of the parent car class. And so how do you tell what's the subclass of what? Well, if you look in the header file of your classes, you'll notice that, let's say, if we look at the view controller class, looking at the header file, we see that the class name is view controller, but this colon followed by this class name, that's what it's subclassing. So UI view controller is actually the parent class of view controller. So view controller inherits all of the properties and methods of the UI view controller class. And this is a class that's in UI kit. And similarly, if you look at the location data controller, you'll notice that the class name is location data controller, but it's actually a subclass of NS object. So if we go back to the uh, view controller.m, the implementation file, remember when you declared the view did appear method and Xcode predicted that that's what you wanted to type in? Well, I told you that that was overriding a method. So overriding methods is a way for a subclass to specify its own unique implementation of a method in its parent class. So in the car example, the car class has a drive method that the BMW car class inherits. That means that if you create a BMW car object and you call drive on it, then it's actually calling the implementation of the drive method in the parents class. Now, what if you wanted your own unique BMW car drive method? What you can do is you can override the drive method. And the way you do that is you declare a drive method in the implementation file of BMW car. And so now when you call drive on BMW car, it actually uses the drive method of the BMW car class and not its parent car class. Now coming back to viewcontroller.m, when we write view did appear like this, we're actually overriding the view did appear method of the UI view controller class, which is the parent of view controller. And little did you know, you're actually already practicing overriding methods. The parent class, the UI view controller, it has a couple of methods like view did load is another overridden method. And you see the statement here, super view did load. Well, super is actually referring to its parents method. So even though view controller is overriding the view did load method with its own implementation, so I can type in something here, do something unique. Do something unique to view controller. So even though I can write my own unique implementation below here, this line says call the view did load method of the parent as well. So not only should you do your own unique thing, but also execute the code in the parent's view did load method. And that's this here. In the view did appear, we could actually also do that. And then you pass in the animated variable that you got from right here. So in this way, we preserve whatever was happening in the parents view did appear method. And then we also add our own custom code that we want executed. So while we're looking at these methods of a view controller, we can talk a little bit about the life cycle of the view controller. So you'll notice that when you create a new instance of the view controller, uh, this method gets triggered, view did load. Well, at this point, the view isn't actually visible to the user yet. So in this method, you can put in code in here that is needed to set up the view controller. Now there's another method 
before view did appear gets called and that's view will appear and in this method it's triggered right before the view is visible to the user now it's a good place to put any code that relates to hiding or showing any ui elements and any code that needs to happen every time the view transitions from not being visible to being displayed remember that if your app has multiple views and you're switching back and forth view will appear and view did appear gets called every time this view controller's view gets displayed on the screen one thing to note that is if you put too much labor intensive code in the view will appear it might actually cause the, the view to lag as it's being displayed to the user. So view did appear, it gets called right after the view appears. At this point, the view is already visible to the user. You can start any animations or any code that needs to execute after the user sees the view. And then from there, you have a couple other ones like view will disappear. And view did disappear. So similar to will appear and did appear, these two methods get triggered as the view is going to leave. And these methods can be used for resetting the state or doing animations as the user leaves the view or setting flags or you know doing any cleanup, that sort of thing. So in this video, you learned about the navigation controller, you learned about subclassing and overriding methods. And if any of that seemed confusing, watch the video again or read the notes in the description below or ask me any questions. And this concludes the basics series. And from here, we're gonna move on to creating some functional applications that are more and more complex. So at this point, you're well on your way to learning iOS and being able to build your own apps. As always, the notes are in the description below. And if you found this lesson helpful, please use the share buttons below the video to share this with any of your friends or family and share it on your social networks. And just help me get the word out there. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys in the next video.